right? I've probably been butchering it until now. And uh, he's been working on his ideas on a new, uh, new kind of experiment to uh, test the one-way speed of light. So Tom, come on up and tell us about that. <laughs> Um, it's not my experiment. Actually, it was the design was created by two Chinese guys, an uncle and his nephew. Uh, the uncle is still in Beijing. He teaches at a petrochemical college, and his nephew is at Virginia Tech. Um, about half of my paper consists of a kind of an introduction and background to this experiment to try to make it understandable, the context of it. Uh, and the paper's kind of long, so I'm going to try to explain briefly what's what's in the what's in the introduction first and then I can get into the experiment itself and I'd like to get everyone uh, to the point where they have some idea of what they're trying to do and what it could do if, if it was successful myself I've been interested in this in this um, issue of one-way light speed for quite a long time I, I, I became interested in the late 60s and one of the earliest books that I uh, read about it was by this guy named Adolf Grunbaum, who was a, uh, at Pitt in the Philosophy of Science Department. And I uh, actually looked on Amazon just before the meeting to, to see if his book was still in print, and you can buy a copy of it for about $200. Uh, it's 200, it's, it's 900 pages long. But the interesting thing about it was that he, he used Einstein's train uh, example uh, to, to show that you could, you could draw a conclusion that was opposite from what Einstein concluded about simultaneity. In other words, you could, you could salvage simultaneity by assuming that the one-way speed of light was different in each direction. So you could kind of recapture uh, absolute simultaneity if you wanted to, and it wouldn't conflict with any empirical data because everyone was using a round trip to establish the speed of light. So you could you could fiddle with the, the data and it would still uh, be empirically acceptable. And a lot of people that were interested in philosophy of science picked up on what Grunbaum had done, and so this issue of the conventionality of simultaneity arose. And in, in Einstein's original presentation in 1905 and, and in the books that he, he uh, wrote later on, he, he explained the whole thing in a very conventional way. I, I'd like to quote a little bit about what he said. He said, But an examination of this supposition, i.e. that one-way light speeds are always the same in opposite directions, would only be possible if we had at our disposal the means of measuring time. It would thus appear that we are moving here in a logical circle. There is only one demand to be made of the definition of simultaneity, namely that in every case it must supply us with an empirical decision as to whether or not the conception that has to be defined is fulfilled. That my definition satisfies this demand is indisputable that light requires the same time to traverse the path from A to M as for the path from B to M uh, is in reality neither a supposition nor a hypothesis. I'm not, I'm not coming through real clear? It's okay. Oh, okay. Anyway, philosophers of science picked up on this and uh, this issue of the conventionality of simultaneity arose and it became very, very interesting to this particular group of people and they're not uh, necessarily closely tied into physicists and, and hands-on experimenters. It was kind of a, uh, something that was going on in a, in a, on an academic level. And the publications were things like Philosophy of Science or News, uh, uh, basically in philosophical journals. Um, this issue was pursued for a number of years, and there were in interesting papers written by John Winnie and by David Malamon about this conventionality issue. And it, it developed over a period of years. There were a whole bunch of different um, takes on it. And eventually, uh, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at the first part of my paper, you'll see that the issue didn't really get resolved and is not even resolved today. If you, 
for example, if you go online and you, and you look up the conventionality of simultaneity on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, you'll find the conclusion to the whole thing is, is, is not uh, uh, clear, that, that even now people have different opinions on it. So this is, this, this is the, the underlying background to the, to the experiment that I want to try to explain to you, which, which um, attempts to, to get a handle on this problem. Can you give me the, uh, the first? You, you should have a clicker there on the oh. podium. But I, I did it for you. I already did it. Okay. This is Einstein's original diagram. Uh, and there have been several speakers before me that have talked about this. Uh, this so-called experiment, the thought experiment. So, uh, the bottom one. Okay. This is the this this is the first the first diagram that the that the two um, Chinese guys uh, produced in their paper. On the left hand side, A K is is what they call a Kerr cell. A Kerr cell is like a high-speed photographic shutter, probably uh, most of you have heard of it. And they say it can operate somewhere between 10 to the 9th or, or, and 10 to the 10th times per second. Uh, and so it allows a, a light source to come through and be modulated and then go through a second Kerr cell to a photo detector on the right. So what you do is you take just a generic light source and you, you basically cut it up into little pieces or little little sausages, if you will. Okay. And then they, they go through a second modulation uh, at BK, and you can see what, what comes out at the other end. And then what they're trying to do is, in the next one, oh, going the wrong way. What, at, at the uh, what comes out of the first the first one is is something that looks like this. Uh, it, 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 in in three in three dimensions, it's more like a sausage than a than a sine wave because uh, it's it's just a, a bunch of light that's been interrupted. Okay. And here's what they try to do. They they, they set the thing up and they measure what comes out of AK to begin with, and then they put the second Kerr cell in, in the same path, and what they try to do is they try to, to find a place where there's absolutely no effect on the signal. So it, it, it's kind of like a, uh, one of these old games at a carnival or something like that where you would shoot at a rabbit that pops up, but in this case, it's not a rabbit you're shooting at, it's a hole that's supposed to open up at just the right time to let the thing go through rather than hit it, if you get the drift of what. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to establish a position going back that's kind of like the difference between those two dotted lines going up. They want to show one cycle, one perfect cycle, uh, one sausage, if you will, that uh, between the two. Now, what they do is they try, they, they move. The pointer is the one at the top. Use your red pointer. Yeah. Okay. There you go. First, they try to move this PK to the point where it's in phase and, and where it doesn't do any modulation, okay? So the signal is going through just, the, just as if it wasn't there at all. And then, they mark that position and then they move to a second position where they try to get the same effect. And so what they've tried to do is between these two, they tried to capture one cycle or one sausage. Okay. Now the second, the second experimental setup is, is, uh, I should say with the first one, you have to turn the whole thing around to do the other, to do the other direction. So what you do is you, you, what you're getting here is how long a, 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 a sausage, or how big of a sausage there is in this direction, and then if you turn it around, you get a sausage in the other direction, 
And that's supposed to be an objective difference in light velocity from side to side. But with this one, you have two, what they've, what they've done here is made this completely symmetrical in space. You don't have to turn around anymore. There are two light sources, each coming from the opposite direction. What they're, what they're trying to do is, is, is find a position where they're getting a maximum signal on both sides uh, now, not just one side. And th now this next slide shows, instead of them being in, in sync, one cycle apart, this, this is a, a diagram of showing them one and a half being half out of phase. And the idea here is that neither of the two Kerr cur cur cells is going to let anything through at all. So you get zero signal on both sides of the previous one. So at B and A, the sensors, with this arrangement, you get nothing. But, you, but with, with this arrangement, you get a maximum on either side. Now, the next, the next problem is to try to superimpose this experiment on Einstein's train example. Uh, and in order to do that, what, what, uh, what I did is I, I created this revision of the train example, which is very similar to something that another philosopher of science, Wesley Salmon, did in his book uh, on space, time, and motion. Uh, so you speed up the you speed up this, the train's velocity to half of the speed of light, and what you want to do is compare this to, to the original, do I go back to uh, Einstein's diagram, okay. So you have Einstein's diagram originally, and now this is kind of like the, this is the updated version, or the, the reconfigured version at half the speed of light. Now, instead of, instead of being almost no difference between x and uh, between m prime and m, now there's a, a huge separation because of the speed of light. In Einstein's diagram, they're practically indistinguishable. All he was looking for was just a, a teeny weeny little bit of difference. Uh, and that's why he called it a long train, because you have to have a really long train to create a, a difference like that. <laughs> Now here is my interpretation of the of the uh, Chinese uh, fellow's experiment in terms of what it would produce. On the top, you see a waves that are produced by the Kerr cell on the left on the on the train and by the Kerr cell on the right. When when the train goes by and the Kerr cells are each producing ten cycles per uh, between the time when they start at A and go to A, A prime, half the way from, from the lightning strike to the embankment. Uh, 10 on the left and 10 on the right, that's what it looks like in a sort of a Galilean uh, sense. On the bottom, you're assuming that the embankment is not only, um, not only an inertial frame, but it also has isotropic light transmission properties. And so what you get is a completely symmetrical system from, from side to side. And if you have the one on the bottom that's symmetrical like that as an assumption, then that's what the train is going to look like. And this is a thought experiment. Again, this is not a, a real experiment, but I'm, it just follows logically 
But if you say that, that light, light velocity is isotropic on, in the embankment, then you're committed to this picture of what's going on in the train, logically. This is the argument, anyway. And this is a schematic of this, what I call the signature of, of, a, of, a, of two frames, one with light velocity, uh, one that's moving at the half the speed of light, and the other one with an isotropic uh, background. Now, so each, each different frame with a different velocity will have uh, a, its own signature. So basically, the idea behind this whole thing is to create an artificial man-made background that is objectively different from system to system and not to rely upon light frequency changes and ideas about uh, uh, preserving physical laws and so forth. So that's the, that's the last part of, uh, of the thing. What I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is to encourage people to read, to read this, to understand this experiment, uh, because I think it might be useful in trying to resolve uh, the, the issue uh, of whether or not inertial frames are the same or not from, from system to system. So that, that's pretty much what I wanted to do. And this, this, this article is from Physics Essays about a year ago. And it, all of the documentation is in the paper, all the references are there. So. Philip, open it up for questions. I know recently, you know, came out a newspaper, you know, Harvard did an experiment where they actually slowed down a photon. Not only did it slow down a photon, but it stopped the photon in reverse directions. Okay. I'm gonna kinda talk about maybe perhaps a thought experiment where the shutter speed is measuring something faster than speed of light. What it happened. And not at all. And also, what that diagram you're talking about shows what metaphysics has been talking about a long time, which is we're in a uh, reality that is layered on top of other realities based on density, dimensions, and frequency. That's it. Well, I should I should point out that. Um, this whole experiment has to be done in a vacuum. No such thing as a vacuum. Pardon? There's no such thing as a vacuum. <laughs> well, <laughs> what what people call a vacuum, then. <laughs> um, and so uh, that experiment with slowing down light was done under uh, extreme conditions in a, in a laboratory. This is just a, a normal uh, transmission in space that, uh, that they, they use in this particular experiment. I, I just thought it was kind of interesting to think a little beyond. Mm. Uh, we're, we're, we're stuck into sphere light and constant sphere light and this. But there, this guy obviously has made thought experimentally to have an experiment created to measure something potentially to capture what happens beyond the sphere light. If you shut the speeds to different distances, and, and you can use a, 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 a beam splitter to, to uh, create a reference frame. Well, they say the same thing, that, that you use a beam splitter instead of a curve cell and do the same thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.